Hello and welcome to this edition of the Deep Green Productions newsletter. Today we are very fortunate to have with us Mr. Sean Kerrigan. Sean is a freelance journalist, an occasional blogger, concentrating on new media, finance, and politics. Welcome to the show. Hi, Deck. Thanks for having me. I'm reading the postings on your website on seankerrigan.com. You've paid some attention to the social component of life, what people do and why they do it. And in a recent interview, you likened our modern industrial society to a, a machine. Maybe you could start by giving us an idea of what that machine is and, and how it works. Sure. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, again, as you said, what people are doing and why they're doing it. And when you study anthropology, sociology, and psychology, you eventually begin to realize that there are a lot of hidden forces in our society that we just sort of accept and we don't usually question it like we should. And it just it doesn't become apparent that we have all these hidden forces controlling us until you really study other societies, basically primitive societies where these machines aren't present. And so I like to look back at the past at what some of the other greats have done and have said about other primitive cultures and how it evolved into the, to the modern soci industrial society that we have today. So one of the things I think about a lot is social arrangements like what we call the machine. And the machine is, is uh, it's not so much a physical machine, but a social machine between people. So a social machine has people as its moving parts, unlike a physical machine which might have cogs or wheels or generators. A social machine has people and there's a hierarchy in which these people are exposed to and forced to comply with. So in a normal machine, you have a cog and that cog is designed to do a very specific function. It doesn't have the autonomy to decide, well, I don't want to be a cog. I want to be a wheel or something like that. And if you have a hammer, your hammer can only do certain things. You can't bake a cake with a hammer. But you can hammer a lot of nails, and that's pretty much all you can do. Social machines work similarly in that they confine people to doing things that that, that the machine wants them to do. So it takes away your freedom. It takes away your, your moral autonomy to do what the machine wants. And usually we all have an experience working with sometimes large companies where we're basically given a job and we're not given very much autonomy in determining what we're allowed to do within that job. And in some social machines, that's more true than others. But increasingly, that's, that's becoming the norm where people are not allowed to engage their moral autonomy. They're not allowed to approach problems the way they would want to. And if they resist in any way, then they're cut loose. The military is a great example. That's, that was probably the first ever machine in, ter in social terms because it really created the standard upon which all other machines since then would be created. So when you look at a corporation, a corporation is a lot like a military. Their, their punishment system isn't as great, isn't as uh, harsh, but it functions in the same way in that it punishes you and brings you into line with their standards of behavior. And they call that freedom, but of course we know that it's not. But it's so prominent, it's everywhere that we sort of accept it. So machines, when I first heard the term machine, I didn't really understand what that meant. I remember back in the 90s, there was a band, still around, called Rage Against the Machine. And they, they talked a lot about politics, left-wing politics mostly. And the machine was like the big topic. And I'm like, well, what is the machine? And I didn't really know. I had a sense that it was more than just the government. But I didn't know exactly how broad that was. And later, as I got older, I studied this one writer, Lewis Mumford, who uh, wrote in the 60s and 70s and earlier too about anthropology, sociology, and basically industrial life. And Mumford basically laid out the idea that the social machine, what he called the mega machine, is really like a lot of, a lot of smaller machines all working together in society that control our behavior. And so Mumford's idea was that we don't have just one machine. 
we have many machines. You know, the military is obviously a machine, but the government is a machine too. The culture is a type of machine. The media is a machine. And they all take away our moral autonomy in different ways. They have different motivations, but they all function in the same way in that they bring people in to this hierarchical system and then deny them their individual autonomy. I see. Um, how does the machine deal with outliers, with criminals or uh, dropouts or people that um, really rage against that particular kind of uh, authority? Well, because each machine, the government and the media and all these other machines, they each have different motivations and different things they want to accomplish. So when someone gets in the way, they have different ways of isolating them. So the media will just ignore you if you come with a message that is contrary to their goals. Uh, the government might try to lock you up. It might try to ignore you. It'll do, it might commit fraud in order to debase you, debase your credibility. Uh, the corporations obviously will fire you if you refuse to follow their dictates. So a good example that I like to use, and I used an SGD report, was this, uh, the, the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill from 20 years ago, where when, the first, when it first happened, one of the board members famously said that, we're going to write this wrong. We're going to make you whole. We're going to reimburse you for the damage that we've caused. This was to the, to the locals in the area. And you're lucky that this happened to you under ExxonMobil's watch because now we're going to fulfill our obligations to you. And what ended up happening was the very next day he was forced to walk back those comments. And the reason is because he was exercising his moral autonomy, that, that particular executive. But the other board members knew that that was not going to fly, that that was a, a dangerous thing to say because if they had gone through with that, their stock would have tanked, their bonds might have become unsustainable. The very company could have gone under under certain circumstances. So they had to walk that back and say, no, we're going to fight this and use lawyers to extend the process out as long as possible and pay as little as possible. That was the machine taking over that person's moral autonomy and saying, no, no, we're going to do things a very precise way in accordance with our goals. So in that case, he wasn't punished per se, but he was silenced and forced to walk back his, his uh, comments. Now, even if everybody at that corporation, the board of directors and the CEO, even if they had wanted to reimburse those people and, and really sta step up and take responsibility for what they had done, they couldn't have done it. Because like I said, the, the, uh, the marketplace, which is another type of machine, comes in and makes sure that that corporation obeys. Because if it doesn't, that corporation will be dissolved and another corporation will come in and take its assets. So the machines just don't operate independently. They're a check on one another, which is really the insidious part of the mega machine, is that you have all these machines which are independent, but they also make sure that they stay in line. They, they collectively make sure that humans cannot have a voice. And that's very dangerous. I mean, think about the idea of, of human beings not having a voice, and yet we think of this as a free society. It's, well, where is it free? Where do we have the ability to, to resist the machines? That's the thing about machines, is that they're not, I mean, they're obviously not human, but their motivations aren't human either. The motivations of a machine are very logical and numeric. They're very based on numbers. So it's all about growth usually. You, usually machines just want to grow. They want to become stronger. But that's not really a human way of looking at the world. You know, we value things that don't necessarily fall into quantifiable numbers. I mean, we value love, but how do you quantify love? Well, machine doesn't even attempt to quantify love. It just ignores it like it's not even there. So machines have motivations which are not human. And as a result, they can be pretty destructive to human needs. 
Do you think there's any way of overcoming this mindset? Well, that's a tough one. Because really what you're asking is, how can we fight the machine? Well, we can fight the government by protesting, maybe by voting. Some people believe that actually works. I don't. Uh, you can fight the media by setting up alternative media in the Internet. You can fight the corporations by protesting or taking them to court. But we're not trying to take on any of these individual items. What we really need to do is we need to take the machine as a whole apart. And that's not something that's easy to do because at the heart of it all, you've got the culture, which is inherently self-destructive. The culture worships a lot of these machines that we have created. You know, there are, there's elements of the culture which worship the military. There's elements of the culture which worship money-making and the corporations. And fighting one of these machines isn't going to cut it because the other machines come in and and make sure that that machine is whole, that it's not endangered in any way. So the media protects the government. The media protects the corporation. The corporations protect the government and so on. It's like a mesh of making sure everything is protected from outside corruption, basically human autonomy. So how do you, how do you take on the entire Western civilization as we've come to know it? And I'm not sure that there's really an answer in terms of restoring human autonomy at a max, like a countrywide level or a worldwide level. The best thing you can do, I think, is restore your own autonomy first. Find, find where the machine is influencing your life and free yourself. That's really the first step in, in just achieving your own independence. And then maybe you can think more broadly about how to how to share that among other people. Some people are projecting a collapse of Western civilization. That, that would probably do it. Yeah, I agree. I think that that might be our only hope is some kind of broader collapse whereby the machine is not able to adapt effectively. Right when you think about energy and power, the Coal made the nation state possible. Without coal, there couldn't have been a country, or any countries around the world, or, or maybe very small ones, but certainly not countries like we think of the United States as. And oil made the, the superpower possible. Basically, energy, cheap energy, allows nations to control larger and larger geographical areas with centralized control. Now, they've been trying to centralize authority over the entire planet for a long time, what some people call, you know, a world government, the United Nations, giving them more and more power. But it hasn't worked. And the reason it hasn't worked is because energy just isn't, isn't plentiful enough to allow that kind of centralization. So we're running out of oil. We're running out of, like, effective coal. There are different grades of quality of coal. But we're, we're running out of all these cheap resources. And so it's becoming harder and harder not only to create a world government, but to keep our nation states from falling apart too. And so as we lose the energy inputs that have created this political system that we have, we're really going to end up losing cohesive control over those areas as well. So we might end up moving back towards something like a city-state type government where things are very, very small. And so there is hope that that will happen. I don't think there's hope that it'll happen in a peaceful way. But unless they come up with some kind of new miracle energy source, which I don't think is likely, that will be the trend over the next 100 years or so, sort of a post-industrial period. So there is hope that the machines, as we've created them, will not be able to function in quite the same way that they did. There'll still be militaries, because militaries have been around for 5,000 years. There's still going to be governments, but they won't be as complex, and, they, and therefore they won't be able to impede human autonomy quite as effectively. In an article you wrote last year, appearing on your website, you talked about technology and its negative impact on society. Do you think that technology is inherently evil? 
Or could technology be put to positive uses? I'm thinking of the Zeitgeist movement and the Venus Project. Right. I agree. I don't think that there's necessarily technolo technology is necessarily evil, but I would say that our mindset is exploitative at its base. Meaning, when we think about new, in the implementation of new technologies, it's always to exploit something, whether it's exploit other human beings or exploit the natural world. It's not knowledge for its own sake. The, uh, the expression is uh, scientia est potentia, which is uh, Latin for knowledge is power. And that's, that's the motto over at DARPA, which is uh, the Pentagon's research division. And knowledge is power is basically how they view knowledge and science and technology. Power over other people, power over the natural world. But knowledge doesn't have to be power. Knowledge can be other things other than power. It can just be knowledge or it can be love. You can know nature and the natural world. You can know your fellow man through knowledge. And you can use that knowledge to help them. You don't have to use that knowledge to control them. So knowledge doesn't have to be power, and neither does technology. It can be beneficial, but you have to start from that mindset that you're not going to use technology and knowledge for exploitative gain, and we don't have that in Western civilization. It might require that uh, collapse that we were just previously talking about in order for that to be accomplished. I think so. I think we're going to have to have some kind of radical change in our viewpoints because explaining these sorts of things to people uh, usually isn't sufficient in order to achieve mass change. Mass change can only happen through, uh, I hate to say force, but that is the effective, the effective reality is that if you want to change people's behavior, you have to encourage them or make it rational for them to change. And through collapse, there becomes the possibility that people might see the rationality in changing their way of being. Right now, it's not rational to change because changing will only bring you pain. If you just decide one day to not, to not go to work or to sell your car, you're going to find life is very unpleasant for you. Uh, it might be spiritually better, but that's a, a big leap for a lot of people to make. But if treating nature with respect and treating your fellow men with respect becomes rational because it's the only way to survive, then it becomes a much greater reality that we can embrace. Well, on the surface, that seems like a pretty tough nut to crack. There's so many different people and there's so much conflict between groups. It's uh, hard to see how we're going to find our way through it. So we've got these gangs in prisons who basically run the prisons now. And what will happen if, if the prisons all of a sudden can't feed them? What will happen? Well, they'll have to release them. And maybe not entirely, but they'll have to have some kind of emancipation program where large numbers of these prisoners are let out into society. And we might find that we have new subcultures that we never knew existed taking over and providing a new, a new type of government in place of the old government, which is no longer viable because it can't survive with the energy needs it has. And so we might have new subcultures come in and sort of take over, and it might be good, it might be bad, but it's going to be very fluid at the least. New gang replacing the old gang. Right, and the new gang might actually be more understanding and rational to us. We might be able to communicate with them in a way that the old gang w would be resistant to, because the old gang had the idea of bureaucracy, which impeded their ability to function effectively. There's no bureaucracy with uh, the mob. Very true. Well, I can see that our time has come to near the end. Sean, I want to thank you very much for joining us today and having a chat about the future and what our prospects are. Uh, are there any final words that you'd like to share with us? And can you also tell us where we might be able to get a hold of you? Well, you can uh, go to my website, which is uh, my first and last name. So it's seankerrigan.com. And you can also find me on Twitter, either through the website or it's just Sean J. Kerrigan. And you can email me through there, and that's usually the best way to find me. And I'll, I'll post uh, usually new articles once a week or certainly once a month. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. All right. Thanks again.
Our guest today has been Sean Kerrigan, and you can read more of his insights into our modern culture at seankerrigan.com. There will be a link posted in the comments below. Thanks very much for watching.